Hi, I'm Susan Kane, and I am here today with Zach Wood, who is the author of the absolutely fantastic new book, Uncensored. And Zach, I have to tell you, it is so exciting for me to be here with you today and such an honor because I absolutely loved your book. It was one of my favorites of the year, and it's such a compelling and poignant memoir on the one hand, and then on the other hand, it's grappling with some of the most intellectually difficult issues of our time. And so thank you for being here with me. Thank you so much. It's so great to be with you. So Zach, in your book, you talk about having been the president while you were at Williams College of a campus club called Uncomfortable Conversations. And in that role, you were inviting provocative speakers to campus, um, including white supremacists. Right. And you said in your book, I invite white supremacy apologists to campus, here's why. Can you talk about why you would have done that, especially in this day and age when white supremacists seem to have an increasing uh, powerfully, powerful hold in our society? One thing for me was that I thought it would be important for, for me and my peers mm -hmm. to be able to go out into the world to articulate differences of opinion and, you know, at Williams College, students care about a number of issues, whether it's the environment, whether it's education, whether it's economic issues, inequality. If you want to succeed in achieving social change, you're inevitably going to have to encounter and talk to and work with mm -hmm. people you deeply disagree with. And I saw college as a, as a good place and an intellectual space in which you could develop the skills and the resources to do that. And what, what would you say to people who would say, okay, well, that's kind of an interesting intellectual exercise, but do you really want to give a platform to people who hold dangerous views? I would say that whenever you're dealing with controversy, there are always costs and benefits. And I do not deny that it is certainly a cost that having a white supremacist on campus is going to offend many people, is going to be challenging for many people, and in some ways is giving oxygen to those views. But I think that the benefits outweigh the costs in that now you have an opportunity intellectually to engage. You also have an opportunity for those who don't want to engage to think about ways of expressing dissent, whether it's through protest, whether it's through not attending the event, whether it's through writing an op-ed in the school paper, or voicing your disagreement in some other way. Mm -hmm. I think there's a certain skill set that you develop in simply thinking about how you're going to deal with that kind of event taking place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you started doing this on campus, you consider yourself, I think, a liberal Democrat, yep. right? And, um, and you had many friends who would consider themselves also liberal Democrats yes. or progressives uh, along those lines. Right. Um, and many of them really were not happy with what you were doing. Um, some were vilifying you. You were even physically threatened. Right. And I would love to know, kind of on an emotional level, how you dealt with those feelings because I, I think those are some of the hardest feelings for human beings to bear really right. because we're such social animals and the minute that happens it's, it's uh, invoking feelings of ostracism and exactly. you know, uh, being banished from the tribe. So how did you feel and how did you deal? It was extremely difficult. I didn't show that or convey that publicly. Mm -hmm. And if, to a certain point, I didn't really even express the fact, and I was, if I was being interviewed about it or asked by a reporter, how difficult has this been? I would say it's tough, but I've managed, and I think the next event is gonna be better than this one. Mm -hmm. But part of what I had to do was think about the figures, historical and contemporary, that I admire, and look at how they handled extremely difficult situations. And one thing I noticed across the board was that when it came time for them to take a stand for something that they believed in, something that they valued, something that they saw as being important to the change they wanted to achieve. They were resilient, they were determined, they were persistent, and they didn't allow the, the emotions which are inevitable mm -hmm. when it comes to dealing with sensitive issues to hold them back from doing what they felt they needed to do. So were you feeling the emotions and saying, I won't let them get in the way, or are you able to compartmentalize so you don't have to feel them for the moment at least while you're dealing? That's a good question. It honestly is, it's some of both. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it was, it's a messy, complicated situation. On the one hand, my life has been challenging and complicated in a number of ways, and that has allowed me to compartmentalize. You know, having a difficult childhood at home mm -hmm. meant that when I went to school, if I wanted to succeed and excel 
and be engaged and fully present in class, I could not let what happened the night before be the main thing in my mind. I had to find a way to put that out of, you see, you see what I mean? And so I trying to figure out how to do that at a young age is very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with something so personal, years later, you're dealing with controversy and it's difficult, but you can say, I've done this before. And you think back and you say, okay, I was able to do it then, I can do it now. And you just resolve to say, I'm not going to let these negative emotions and negative feelings have the last word. I'm going to think about this as an opportunity for me to rise. Right. Okay. So you're saying when, when the difficult moments happen in your life right. now, right. You're, you're actually consciously saying to yourself, I've done difficult things like this I've and worse. Far, far more worse. difficult, far more personal, mm -hmm. intimate challenges, you know, with my mother, with family. And if I can handle that, and if I was able to overcome that and get to this point, there's no way I can let this hold me back or right, stop me. Right, right. So you're sort of consciously emboldening yourself that exactly. way. Exactly. And then also yeah. looking at, you know, figures I admire, political figures, public figures, great leaders and activists, mm -hmm. and saying, you know, they had to withstand controversy on a daily basis. And in some sense, it comes with the territory. I'd like to pursue a career in public service one day. Mm -hmm. and there are changes I would like to be a part of making in the world. And in order to do that, I realize that there's never going to be a scenario in which everyone is, is happy with what you're doing. You know yeah, what I mean? So you're yeah, going to have to, to learn how to deal with those, those situations in which people are really upset. It's funny that you mention that, because I don't know if you saw this in the news. I think it was a few days ago, but um, there's a poem by Rudyard Kipling, uh, the poem If which I noticed you have as the opening yes. to your book. Yep. And it's really a poem about self-mastery, and it's yes, a poem about exactly. all the things you were just talking exactly. about. Um, and apparently at Manchester University in the UK, um, that poem was um, emblazoned on, I think an artist had painted it okay. on a wall of the campus. Uh -huh. uh, and some student protesters had asked to take it down because apparently Rudyard Kipling had some pretty yeah. Uh, yeah. Problematic views. Pretty exactly. problematic okay. views. Yeah, I actually I had always loved that poem and not known anything about Kipling, yeah. uh -huh. so uh, it was interesting to read that. And and so I guess I'm curious to hear your take on a question like that. Like, what do you do with um, a work of art or a work of political thought or whatever right. it is um, that has value in and of itself, but the person who put it forth has some dangerous or problematic views? What's your thought? I think that, and you, we've seen this, this issue come up on a number of campuses across the country with monuments sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it's with art. I think there's a sense in which if you are going to remove it or take it down, it's almost as if you're trying to erase history. That's mm -hmm. one thing I think. At the same time, I think it's very important to note that there are great figures who've done great things who also had very problematic views, mm -hmm. right? who also made very bad decisions, right? Who also did things that many of us would find immoral and we should acknowledge that and say that, because if we were to say that just because someone held slaves, we're not gonna honor them in any way or give them any recognition, I think it would be very difficult because our nation's capital is named after someone who at some point in their life mm -hmm. held slaves. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes this, this difficult terrain in which you say, are we really not gonna honor anyone who did something that was utterly detestable, mm -hmm. but also something that was done at that time by the majority of those who had power and influence. Mm -hmm. So I think, in my view, what's important is acknowledging these figures for who they really are. They are not perfect. They're not saviors, they're not saints. Yet they did accomplish significant things that have been critical for our democracy and society since their time. And so I think trying to address the complexities of who they were is really important. But I wouldn't say we should take the art down. What if, uh, I, I can imagine the response being, um, well, there's only so much wall space at the right. university, right. and so why should we choose to give this very limited space to someone with this kind of background? And in fact, I, I think what ended up happening, I don't know the ins and outs of this particular story, but I think they ended up taking down the Kipling poem and putting up something by Maya Angelou instead. Right. So what, what do you think of that? I would love to see something up by both of them. Mm -hmm. But in the case of taking Kipling down, you know, I think he was around long before I was, and so 
I only know what I've read about him in, in history books mm -hmm. and things of that sort, but I'm sure he was a complicated, you know, people are, are complicated, human beings are naturally complicated. And so to say that because he had views that were held by many to be racist at the time, that in some sense would apply to so many people. I don't think that doesn't mean that we can't appreciate his, his art, his poetry. Mm -hmm. He's written about a number of things. And in the poem that I have in my book, you know, when he says, to try to keep your head when all men doubt you, that poem has nothing to do with race. Right. right. You know, there are poems he's written that have nothing to do with, with the views that we really find deeply unsettling. And so I think it's, we shouldn't reduce who he was as an artist or a person to the most negative or problematic instances of his career. So, so far we've been talking about how to think about people on the other side of a divide, how to hold your own head, really, right, yeah, um, yeah. When, when there are forces coming at yeah. you. What about the question of how do you reach hearts and the hearts and minds of people who disagree with you? And how do you have discussions um, with people across a divide that end up bringing them closer together instead of further polarizing them? And I think this is something, you know, it's, it's obviously happening at a grand political scale right now in, in, in our society, but it's also happening at all of our dinner tables. Yes. And so what should we do? I think we have to be attentive to the circumstances, to the specific individual or individuals we're trying to reach. And we have to show them that this is about more than winning an argument or persuading someone. We have to show them that we are interested in humanity and helping humanity and understanding humanity. And I think the first step there is conveying an interest in their story, mm -hmm. conveying an interest in how they develop the views that they hold, especially the ones we find very problematic. Because when you approach someone with a difficult issue, or an issue you know that you disagree on, if the first thing you're doing is let me tell you why you're wrong, mm -hmm. it makes people combative, it makes people defensive. All of the assumptions that they would readily make about, you know, I knew this is what you thought, mm -hmm. you know, I knew this is what you wanted, you know, what you wanted me to say or what you wanted me to think, it kind of walls them off. Mm -hmm. But if you approach it and say, you know, I'm interested in knowing more about why you think X mm -hmm. or what experiences in your life, what things that you've read led you to that point, then I think there's an opportunity there for you to, to build an understanding of them and to build an understanding of how many people who hold similar views got to that point. And what, what do you do when you have that kind of open yeah, discussion yeah. and you're still, you're here and they're there? It's, it, it, that's gonna happen. Yeah. That's gonna happen often. You yeah. know, it's, it is a slow, arduous, incremental process. And while there are steps that can be taken, there is no perfect guide that will work for every person. I would say, that you try to take what you can. And what I mean by that is, if there's one thing you can glean from this person about you know, why they think the way they do, why they view the world in the way that they do, that that, that understanding that you've gained there can be applied to other circumstances and situations. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't be disappointed if, at the end of the conversation, they walk away thinking the same thing and you walk away thinking <laughs> right. the same thing. That's yeah. gonna happen probably. 60, 70, 80 percent of the time, it depends, yeah, right? Yeah. But I wouldn't let that discourage. I would hope it wouldn't discourage people from trying to make the effort. I'll tell you about an experience I had. Uh, it was about a year ago, and a truck parked outside my family's house, and the, the windows of the truck were full of Nazi stickers, and not just the swastikas, but the, the Nazi paramilitary um, symbols. And, um, and I was kind of looking at these symbols all day long. Right. And, um, and then at the end of the day, the guy who owned the truck came back and I went outside. Uh, my husband had actually asked me to wait for him to come home, but he wasn't home yet. Okay. And there was the guy, so right. it was like the only time. Um, so I went outside and I brought with me a photograph of many of my family members who were killed in the Holocaust. And I asked him why he wanted to drive around with a truck that would be so upsetting to so right. many people. Yeah. 
and it was a really interesting experience. I mean, we could talk about it another time, a yeah, whole yeah. long conversation that we had, um, but... So you were able to have a long conversation. Though. Yeah, I mean, the weirdest thing about it, I had actually, I, like, I didn't know who this guy was gonna be. I, I was scared, I was physically scared when I went out. I actually asked a neighbor to, you know, just keep an eye out. Right, um, in case, right. It, just in case, but it turned out he was like, he was this very young, friendly, affable guy. Really? Yeah, yeah, and we ended up talking for a really long time. And I found it confusing on so many levels because he was affable on the one hand and affiliated with a murderous ideology on the other hand. And I, I think that's one of the dangers sometimes or the, what can be confusing about right. the philosophy that you hold, which is it becomes sometimes difficult to distinguish in that moment. Right. Who is, who is affable and... Yeah, yeah. And, and like I started yeah. out... I. I I went to talk to him thinking maybe there's a chance to change minds here. Right. And I don't know if his mind was secretly changed, but he didn't say it was by the end. He and did. so you kind of walk away thinking, well, was that a good idea or not? What was his yeah. initial response when you showed him the pictures? Did he, he said, did he understand why you were? Yeah, he did. And he okay. basically said, no offense against your family. I'm sure they were nice people, but, the, huh. but this is what had to be done. I think it's, I mean, that kind of points precisely to one of the very difficult areas you reach yeah. when having these kinds of interactions. There's this natural tendency we have to like, oh, good person, bad person. Mm -hmm. Like just like a kind of way of thinking. And the, with this, the situation you're pointing to, here's this affable guy who talked to you for an extended period of time, yet who holds views that the overwhelming, I mean, you know what I mean? That are just absolutely yeah. and dangerous. horrendous and dangerous yeah. to yeah. society. Yeah. And how do you make sense of that? Right. Is this someone who, with five more conversations like that, could potentially change their mind? I would say that I would never, with respect to something like that, say that I think everyone should have that conversation because I think people are different. I think it depends upon, you know, if, if you think that having that conversation is only going to make you feel more in a more negative way or feel more anxious or that you're not going to be able to gain something from it, then you have to consider that. But I do think that we should generally try to be more open. And you can take things in degrees because that's a very, you see what I mean, that's an, not just a sensitive issue but someone with extremely, those are extreme views. Yeah. yeah. So maybe scaling it down. Yeah, by the way, I don't mean to equate all the people who you invited oh, to campus yeah, no, no, with this guy. Yeah, totally, I think it's yeah, important to sure, say yeah, that because course, course. The, the stuff is, right. yeah. But I would say it's not that I ever think everyone should be able to, to do this and do it easily or do it effectively or that they're going to do it once and then they're going to say, I get it now, I can have difficult conversations anytime. But that if you try, if you make the effort once, twice, that there, there's potential to really gain something valuable there that you, you wouldn't be able to if you didn't make the initial step. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay, wait, I'm gonna go to a less extreme situation, okay, which yeah, is, sure, yeah. I know um, you, you, were, you were saying before we started that um, one great technique that you've come up with right. um, is to swap media diets with friends yes. who are on the opposite side right. of a political, right. a political spectrum. So right. can you talk a little bit more about that? and? what happened when you did that swap? So I was interested in trying to, to get a sense of, because you know, we watch the news, we read newspapers, that's how we get our information, that's how we know what's going on in the world. I was interested in understanding how does that play into the formation and reinforcement of, of views, specifically views that I deeply disagree with. And so I was thinking to myself, what's like a feasible, practical way of, of like getting a better sense of that? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, who are the friends I have mm -hmm. that I know I don't see eye to eye with on many things? What if I were to, for the next week or two, just watch the news channels they watch, just read the newspapers and the magazines they read, if I did everything I could to make my news feed their news feed for a week, mm -hmm. just to get a sense, like what are, the, what are the things that they're hearing, right? What's the message there? And it's really interesting, it's really fascinating when you do it because you're so used to I mean, in some sense, that's the way social media works now. Mm -hmm. The algorithms right. kind of reinforce your own biases. And so I think, I mean, it's, 
for me, it was insightful doing it with my mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great way to, to take that initial step of saying, I'm going to try to familiarize myself with someone else's position mm -hmm. and really the sources that inform yeah, that position. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it, it strikes me that the common thread in what you're saying is to really get to know who each person is um, right. on the in, from the inside out. Right. And I was struck even in your book, you, I, I think you opened the book by relating people asking you kind of what I asked you at the beginning, right. which was how did you have the wherewithal to withstand all these people criticizing you? And your answer to that was basically, let me tell you the story of my life. Um, and then you told it, you know, exactly. in a whole book. Right. And, right. and you're exactly. saying the story, my, my life was so difficult growing up that it gave me the fortitude to withstand what was to come later. Exactly. Um, so, like, what, what is it about telling our personal stories that is so transformative? I think one sense, in one sense what you're doing is you're exploring your own journey and how you got to where you are. Mm -hmm. You're reflecting back on experiences that maybe you thought about before but not in as much of an organized way. You're going back to difficult, rough patches in your life and you're saying, how did I make it through yeah. these things? Because if now I'm in a position to write this and to share with the world, I made it through somehow. What were the factors? Mm -hmm. What were the, the difficult moments? What were the moments that gave you hope? And so in, for me, writing uncensored, it was all of that and more. Mm -hmm. And one thing I realized in writing it was that school for me became the, the main positive aspect of, of my life. Mm -hmm. Like the, mm -hmm. the most positive facet of my life was going to school and doing everything I could to excel there. Because at home, you know, I never knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the time, it was not good. And I had no way, you know, as a child, you're totally dependent on your parent. And so I'm living with a mother who has a mental illness, and that is extremely difficult. And so the only thing I really could look forward to on a regular basis was going to school, contributing in class, doing well, reading, things like that. And so your things that you should receive at home, mm -hmm. I had to find those things elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that was one thing I kind of learned about myself in the process. And I think it really explains the drive I have now to mm -hmm. continue building a deeper understanding of people, to continue gaining knowledge, and seeing that knowledge as something that will help me later in life. I mean, it, it's interesting because you, you talk quite a bit and really poignantly about your experiences um, right. yeah. at some of these quite elite schools that you attended. Um, and you talk about what it was like to be an African-American student from a rougher neighborhood right. going right. to largely white schools. Exactly. And there's one thing you said, uh, let me see if I can find it. You said while you were at school, it, it seems like you had a feeling of, of needing to represent your race well. And, and, right. yeah. and you said, I always tried my best to show through my own actions that the things they believed about black people weren't true. Um, and I was really struck by that because that seems like a gigantic burden to carry into every social interaction. It's not good, even though it, it can make you a stronger person, um, it can build character in a sense, it can help you learn how to deal with a very uncomfortable situation. I would not hope or you know, wish that anyone else would have to deal with that because yeah. essentially the situation you're faced with is you realize very quickly that you're one of a handful of students here who look like you. Yeah. And so, you know, in your history class, you may be the only black student in your history class. And so when you're talking about the Civil War and the issue of slavery comes up or an issue of race comes up, yeah. everyone kind of looks at you. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, and it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And what you say, it's not just Zach's opinion, right? Yeah, right? It's, right. it's implied that this is what, you know, exactly. and so in that sense, a it, of, of your race, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so constantly having that in the back of your mind and having to think, okay, I understand there's nothing I can, I can do here to, and, and at some, in some ways you can, but communicate that there, I represent myself and I'm saying what I think and you shouldn't just assume based upon what I say that this is what all African Americans think mm -hmm, and feel. Mm -hmm. That can be tough to say in fourth grade. Yeah. So there's yeah. this pressure on you to say, well, what's the perfect thing to say? What's the right thing to say? 
and it's just it's it's tough it's like an added weight yeah i mean it do you, you have such a thoughtful way of speaking and thinking and do you think that part of it comes from always measuring your words in the way you just described yes. always measuring my words and then having a mom who would analyze everything uh -huh. everything uh -huh. i did all the time uh, you know always modifying things she would be upset over this the slightest things she saw life so much of life as in some ways being like a social evaluation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so she mm -hmm. wanted me to pass those tests right. to right? right and so that's what she was constantly training me for coaching me for it was like a drill everything was a drill with her and she introduces me to a friend or introduces me to her boss or a colleague it's a test what do they mm -hmm. say to her after i leave what do they say to her the next day what's you know what i mean yeah yeah and then at home, she would talk to me about what I did well, what I didn't do well. And it was never a calm conversation. She would get very upset in these instances. So you're, you're having to deal with, you know, your mom putting this pressure on you. Right, right. I mean, that's really, it's interesting because it's, it's kind of a, it's a more extreme version, I think, of what many people feel on some level. Yeah, so I'm curious, right. like, have you developed any techniques for being able to just sort of relax and be you uh, over time? Or how do, you, how do you think about that now as an adult? As an adult, one yeah. thing is focusing on trying to distill for myself in my head what matters most to me in the moment. What am I really trying to achieve? I can focus on all these things. And, yeah. you know, naturally there are a number of things. There are certain things that are automatic now mm -hmm. that, you know, because my mom, she made me aware of them. And so, you know, you're it's kind of a forced attentiveness at yeah, first, yeah. and then it just becomes a natural inclination almost. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've learned to do is just to distill for myself what matters most to me in this moment. What's the message I want to convey? What's the point I want to make? Or what's the, you know, what do I want to learn or what do I want to gain? Mm -hmm. And if I can focus on that, then I know I'll be all right. right. Because I have, there's a sense of personal clarity. Yeah, no, I completely get that. It's funny, that's, that's sort of a variation of something I've learned to do over the years, which is kind of train myself to think of about what is my inner conviction about whatever happens yeah, to be happening. Right. Yeah. And I think like if you're speaking from a place of conviction, it doesn't really matter exactly. you know, how loud you are, how tall you are, exactly. or any of these other exactly. externalities. Exactly. It's the conviction yeah. that's carrying you. Exactly, exactly. So, I totally yeah. agree. And I would say that's something that I think can apply widely for people just focusing being trying to be in the moment right. one thing that one effect of my mom drilling and coaching me in the way that she did is you're so focused on all these little things yeah. that you're, you're not like fully present in the moment right and even right. though you're talking to people and you're you know using these things she taught you're not like enjoying it you know what I mean you won't you know mm -hmm. some experiences are very unique because you're thinking more like how did I do how, how did, did I do you? how did yeah. I do what did, yeah. how did that go did yeah. it go okay can I do better next time yeah but just trying to be really in the moment I think is important. So, okay, I mean, this is really interesting. For somebody like who, like you who's describing yourself as right. always thinking, how did I do? Yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting decision to write as personal a memoir as you did. Uh -huh. um, and especially for somebody of the, the talents and the ambitions that you have. I mean, in this memoir, you really laid yourself bare yeah. in many yeah. ways. I mean, you talked about a lot of vulnerabilities. Exactly. Um, you strike me as an extremely conscientious person, and yet you yeah. talk about a time in your life where you did something that was the opposite of conscientious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, what is it like to lay all that out there? It was incredibly difficult to do. One of the most difficult things I've ever done. And in that sense, it's like a big learning experience. Yeah, I bet. And you're and you're thinking first it's on the page, and then it's in the hands of an editor, and then it's in the hands of whoever picks it up at the bookstore. Right. And, and having that in your mind, you know, that this is something I'm sharing publicly. I had to remind myself of what I was really trying to do. Which was what? Why did you do this? I thought that, you know, it's, it's my belief, and this is a conviction that I have, mm -hmm. that one of the best ways to really build empathy and compassion is through vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Through putting yourself out there and saying, it may look like I've got it all together, mm -hmm. or it may look like I am totally sure of this mm -hmm. or totally sure of that, but actually, you know, these are a number of places and points in my life in which I've had 
all kinds of doubts, mm -hmm. in which I've made mistakes, in which I've learned things about myself, mm -hmm. in which I've become a stronger person. And those are the things, when I've read memoirs, that's really where I've learned the most. Things I can apply to my own life about that particular individual. And so that's what I was really going after mm -hmm. in writing something that was so deeply personal. And like, I mean, it, it seems quite likely that you might have a career not only as a future writer, but also as maybe a future politician, and right. I hope you do. Yes. And are, like, do you worry about people twisting around some of the things that you wrote? You know, it was, uh, it was certainly a consideration. Mm -hmm. I, I thought to myself, one or two lines in this book, any one or two lines can be a new cycle. Yes. If, you know, yeah, if I um, you know, am successful in pursuing a career in public service, that's something that is not just possible, but in some sense likely to happen. Mm -hmm. But then I, it's, it was, again, was weighing costs and benefits and thinking yeah. about, well, that's one of the costs associated with doing this. What are the benefits? I get to speak about my life in ways that I hope people will be able to connect with. I'm able to share my opinions on issues that matter to me very deeply. Mm -hmm. In the end, the net gain seemed greater than what the potential losses could be. Mm -hmm. And so then it became a matter of thinking about, you know, when I'm asked about this, you know, what am I going to say? What am I gonna say? Yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. if someone walks up and says, I read your book, X, Y, Z, you know, what am I going to say? Right. So they were certainly like self-prep mm -hmm. aspects to it and preparing mm -hmm. myself for the fact that once this is out on the shelf, it's, it's just not in your hands anymore. Yeah, it's, it's out there, nothing you yeah. can do. Yeah. There's one thing you talked about in the book that um, was such a big part of your life, and I'm not sure that all our listeners are as familiar with it as we all should be, and that is the burden that you felt to do code switching um, yes. when you were going to these schools growing up. So can you talk about what code switching is and yeah. what it felt like for you? So code switching is really when you modify your behavior, your demeanor, your attitude based upon the environment that you're in. Mm -hmm. And so when I am growing up in, rough, in, a, in a rough area in Detroit yeah. and then going to school in an affluent suburb mm -hmm. in Gross Point Farms, that's what the suburb right. was called. Right. Those Which are like two totally different streets worlds, of streets of mansions yeah. and manors. And we're talking homes with eight bedrooms, 10 bedrooms, basketball courts, tennis courts, things like that, pool houses. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I lived a block away from me was public housing. Mm -hmm. And so how do you navigate moving between, on a daily basis such drastically different environments? One thing, and my mom actually played a big role here too, one thing you have to do, because we naturally all want to belong to the mm -hmm. communities we're a part of. Yeah. We want to fit in, we want to be liked, we want to do well, we want to succeed. That entails modifying your behavior, right? In, in my neighborhood, I would say less. I would have to change my demeanor. I would have to change the way in which I interacted and approached people. Mm -hmm. In school, why would you say less? Was talking too much? Uh, well, w in some way? it was dangerous in some way uh -huh. because there's a sense in which that could be taken as a sign of naivety or a sign mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. right. Another thing too is that I'm known as the kid who goes to the school that's not right. nearby, yeah. but I go to yeah. the school in Gross Point. Yeah, you know, I've been seen reading. You know, things like this. Mm -hmm. You already stand out. Right. You know, and there's, so there's less, in some sense, that you have in common. You're in the neighborhood, but I moved around a lot, so I'm often new to the neighborhood, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And maybe I have some different, the fact that I like to read and I like to write mm -hmm. and like to speak mm -hmm. and things like that. How does that, how do you then gel with the, the other kids in your neighborhood who don't have the same opportunities, who haven't had the same experiences and see you doing these things? There's a sense in which when you're in environments that are under-resourced, mm -hmm. communities that face crime and violence, the environments are contested and people tend to withdraw and they tend to say less, mm -hmm. generally, mm -hmm. because it, mm -hmm. it's like a defense mechanism in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like you're better protected if you say less. The less you say, the, the less, less trouble you, you can The less trouble it. you could possibly cause. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you don't know how someone's going to react to what you're right, saying. Right, right. People are dealing with a number of challenges from 
not having food on the table to losing their job. Tension is often high. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's tension between the communities and the police. There's yes, all these things right. going on. Sometimes it's just better to just say less. Right. And so you were getting up at four in the morning. And then you were yeah. getting on to, I guess, sometimes the bus or the subway, the and, train, and it was two or three hours, hours. Yeah, and then yeah. suddenly you arrive at school, and now you're supposed to talk a lot yep, now and, supposed to talk, yep, and be exactly. very carefree. Right? Be, yep, be carefree, be very engaged, to be on, honestly, to be on uh, all the yeah. time, uh, because I was a good student, and, you know, it's like once you do it once, you know, the expectation is there, and there's a self-expectation as well being that school is the, the only consistent positive in my life, right. right? This thing, the one thing that I always looked forward to, the last thing I wanted was to ever have a day where I wasn't on, mm -hmm. where I didn't fulfill my own you know, expectations for myself, where as a student tutor, I didn't have the, the bandwidth to like be as attentive to the individual needs of the person I was working with or I was stressed about something that was going on at home and so I wasn't as engaged in class. Those were things that I tried to avoid whenever I could. What, so what did you do with the stresses? Because you, you had a lot of stresses, so where'd you put them? Some of it was, some of it was compartmentalizing, mm -hmm. literally just tucking it away and saying, I'm not gonna, show, I'm gonna, I'm right gonna walk in and just act like none of that exists. None of that, ha whatever happened on the bus, whatever's going on at home, none of it exists. To, now I'm just going to focus on what we're doing in class, what the teacher said, what question do, questions do I have during class, after class. You focus on being fully engaged there. Mm -hmm. And in some, some sense, it was also like an escape. So that made it that was like the, easier the in some sense. Yes, that was the enticement. That Is that, exactly. Yeah. It's like it's an escape in a sense. Yeah. Because I really, I mean, I loved reading. I loved learning. And so in that sense, I could kind of throw myself into it and enjoy it at the same time. Yeah, I have to say, you know, I've always thought of myself as someone who really loves reading, right, but yeah. like, it's like nothing compared to what, <laughs> I, I, you might be the most intellectually voracious person <laughs> I've ever like, come across. And I, like, I'm curious how you do that exactly. And right. how do you remember everything that you read? Because you read a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, part of it was this kind of curiosity uh -huh. that I had to, to understand one in this relates to the uncomfortable learning idea. How do brilliant, motivated people come to see the world in such different ways? That right. motivating question. It's that, that's the question that's, that's at like the heart the of everything you it do. It really right? is. How is yeah. it that people come to see things in such different ways in terms of what they think the government should do, in terms of what they think our society should be doing, in terms of what they think is right and wrong, good and bad? Like that question has always fascinated me. Interesting, and that's the question yeah. that we need to be asking and answering right. the most right exactly. now of all possible Because questions. if you think about it, you really don't know. You, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. And it's different for different people. Right. So that kind of like motivated me to read about different issues and to see, well, what do people think here? For instance, if you take two sociologists mm -hmm. or psychologists or economists and you say they have access, each of them have access to resources and evidence and data and can conduct studies and do research, mm -hmm. yet it's very likely that they don't think the exact same thing. Right, how, right. how does that happen? Right, you know, right. what, is, what are the, the life aspects, what are the circumstantial aspects? Thinking about that for me was kind of at the heart of everything that I've done when it comes to reading. And um, then also wanting to gain a better understanding of people and issues so that I would, I hope, be better to lead. I would be able to lead better in the future. So the way I looked at it was, if I understand the nuances and the complexities of different issue areas, I will then be better prepared. I'll have a better understanding of the nuances of, of people that I hope to one day be in a position mm -hmm. and have to, to serve. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's always tied to the broader goal of you know, public service mm -hmm. later in life. Mm -hmm. And you've had that drive to public service from the very beginning, it seems like. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So the, it's always been connected. Mm -hmm. My love of learning, you know, there's a sense in which reading a great novel for me is like an escape. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I love it. I can just get lost in a book. And then there's a sense in which I'm just this curious person who wants to know more about things. Mm -hmm. But broadly speaking, it's always, or often I'm asking myself, what I'm reading about now, in what ways can I use this later on? Mm 
Mm-hmm. What circumstances can I apply this to? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so that, it motivates me to remember, right. to try to remember what right. it is that I'm reading. And then I'll oftentimes go back to things. So when I read stuff, I always flag it. Yeah. You know, I'll write down notes. If I'm reading like academic articles, four or five sentences. Here's what I think. Here's what I think I can take away from it. And then I'll go back to that. So do you have a file of all your notes from all your books? I do have not all of them, but a number of them. I do. Yeah. I want to kind of bring it back at the end to where we started, which is the burning question that I think so many people have of what to do with their families at the dinner table, (laughs) where, you know, people feel divided in ways they never have before. Um, So can you kind of pull together some of the strands we've been talking about to give advice to those people? Sure, sure. So one thing is maybe start those conversations on a lighter note. Uh Don't just dive headfirst into the, the political, moral, issues that are at hand Mm -hmm. and then to think about especially if it's if it's family or friends and these are people you know that you're comfortable with to try to get a sense of what it is that motivates them and what it is that bothers them about whatever the issue is whether the issue is taxes or immigration or who we have in office whatever the issue may be Mm -hmm. to get a sense of what at the heart of it really what's moving them, mm-hmm. right? What really bothers them? Because sometimes you've got the surface level understanding right. and people right. will say this is unequal, this is why it bothers me, but sometimes there's something even deeper mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And so if you can get a sense of what that is, begin with questions. What do you do with your own emotions while yeah. they're answering yeah. the questions and maybe saying things that, that are upsetting? I would say it's to try as best you can to communicate how you feel without showing it in a way that can kind of push the other person away from you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I would kind of advise against raising your voice too much or cutting them off very often or just totally dismissing what they're saying. But say, actually that makes me feel very X or Y and here is why. To try to think about how to actually articulate this is, this is why what you just said really concerns me. Mm -hmm. It's because I think that when people say things like that, this is what it can lead to. This is what it has led to in history. These are the the negative consequences of such statements. And when someone who is in a position of influence says it, this is the the chain reaction that we've seen. This is why it it bothers me. Mm -hmm. So to like make that clear Mm -hmm. without doing it in a way that's overbearing Mm -hmm. or that can make the other person more combative. That's great advice. Well, Zach, thank you so much. It really has been fantastic to sit down and talk to you. And I really hope everybody reads your book. Thank you. Really good. Thank you so much.